about neuromuscular disorders. Specifically, as I said, we're going to talk about Guillain-Barre and myasthenia gravis just because your clin clinical simulation exam will test you on a case study from these two specifics. So just reviewing respiratory um, anatomy and physiology, there's different parts of the respiratory system. We've discussed the airways through the tracheobronchial tree. We've discussed the lungs themselves, and that's the functional unit that, um, that, that are made up of the uh, lung parenchyma or the alveoli or the acenus, whatever term you want to use. Um, there's the blood vessels that surround the, the uh, alveoli, so the alveolar capillary membrane, and that is the uh, location of gas exchange. And then there's the part that uh, we've talked about some, and that's the muscles. So the diaphragm and your intercostals, remember, that's what creates that pressure gradient um, that allows uh, air to flow from the ambient environment down into the lungs. So it's your diaphragm and intercostals that create that vacuum uh, when you're breathing, when you're breathing uh, negative pressure. Chemoreceptors. If you guys remember what chemoreceptors are, there's two different types. There's the peripheral oxygen chemoreceptors. They're located in the carotid and aortic bodies. They are the ones that signal your diaphragm and intercostals to breathe based on your PaO2. So when the PaO2 gets down below 60 torr, it'll send signals to your brain to say, hey, you need to start increasing your minute ventilation by stimulating your diaphragm and your intercostals. Those are a secondary response. Uh, the main response are the central chemoreceptors that are located in the medulla and they respond to your hydrogen ion concentration. So if we start hypoventilating, our carbon dioxide level will go up, which through um, the hydrolysis equation turns into more hydrogen ion uh, concentration that will increase. That's when your body will say, hey, stimulate your intercostals and diaphragm to breathe and you'll increase your respiratory rate and therefore your minute ventilation. Your neuromuscular junctions. So nerves uh, contact muscles at that synaptic area called the neuromuscular junction. And the nerve impulse stimulates a nerve uh, ending uh, to release acetylcholine. Okay, so we have to have that acetylcholine to have the, the, ner the muscle movement, the nerve um, stimulating the muscles. So acetylcholine reaches the receptors and at that point, the muscle fiber contracts. If there's something called acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme, it will break down the acetylcholine. And of course, if there's uh, that acetylcholine doesn't make it uh, to the nerve ending, muscles won't move. Okay, and we're going to talk about that today. This is a review, but very, very important. So talking about your ventilator, excuse me, ventilation assessment and assessing for muscle strength and ventilation strength, uh, we can look at our tidal volume. So normally we breathe spontaneously, you and, all, you and I right here, we breathe at about four to six milliliters per every kilogram of our body weight. So let's say if I'm 60 kilos, um, I'm breathing at about 240 to 360 milliliters every breath, every tidal volume. That is based on our height, not exactly our weight, and we will get more into predicted body weight. Um, but of our predicted body weight, it's about four to six milliliters per kilo. If we're taking really shallow breaths, so if we're only breathing at like one to two to three mils uh, per kilo of body weight, uh, we can get atelectasis. So if we're breathing fast and shallow, a lot of our volume will be trapped in our anatomic dead space zone. So it'll turn into dead space and it will not participate in gas exchange. Our respiratory rate should be about 12 to 20 breaths per minute. 
If a patient's breathing greater than, an adult patient is breathing greater than 35 breaths per minute, they will probably go into respiratory failure because they will not be able to get the depth they need. And once again, uh, their, their uh, bodies uh, will not go into appropriate, appropriate gas exchange. Minute ventilation is our tidal volume times our respiratory rate. So that's how deep and how fast we're breathing. The average person breathes 4,000 milliliters per minute, which is the same thing as four liters per minute. If your patient is having to breathe uh, 10 liters per minute to keep a normal uh, carbon dioxide level, that's going to be an indication that they're going to go into respiratory failure. A vital capacity, which is the vital capacity is made up of our uh, different lung volumes, all three of them besides residual volume. So inspiratory reserve volume, our tidal volume, and our expiratory reserve volume. So if we take a big breath, all of that is our vital capacity. Our vital capacity, we should be able to easily get 15 milliliters per kilo of our ideal body weight. And if we have let, if we're unable to get 15 mils per kilo, that also indicates that we are going to go into respiratory failure. The next one is called a maximum inspiratory pressure. The synonymous term, and they're interchangeable, you'll hear them both, the negative inspiratory force, so MIP or NIF. If you remember in school, we had myself take a big breath in and have a little manometer, and that went negative. So the greater pressure we breathe in, we will have a greater negative inspiratory force. So uh, negative 30, negative 25, negative 30, if it's less than negative 25, that indicates uh, respiratory failure. So negative 60 is probably what you and I could all do. If we were really, if we had really weak muscles due to a neuromuscular issue, we might only be able to get negative 20 centimeters of water pressure. So negative 15, negative 20, negative 25 is bad. Negative 30 all the way up to negative 80 is, is, is better. So the more negative, the better. Our pH value should be 7.35 to 7.45. If we have less than a 7.25, uh, usually in an accompanying with a high CO2 level, that's going to indicate that your patient needs into initiation of uh, mechanical ventilation. They need to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. The PACO2 value should be anywhere between 35 and 45. If it's greater than 45 TOR, it's called hypercarbia, and that's due to hypoventilation. If it's less than 35 TOR, that's called hypocarbia, and that's due to hyperventilation. So remember, um, your CO2 level and your minute ventilation are inversely proportional. So the more minute ventilation you have, the lower your carbon dioxide level is going to be. I'm going to have you guys watch this video on doing a vital let me turn it up for you. Oh, hold on. Let me try that again, you guys. I'm going to just um, end this quickly so I can turn up the volume. Okay, can you guys hear this at all? Yeah, I can hear it. Okay, good.
otherwise cannot keep up with them. I will cover that more in next fall in preliminary function testing. Just to understand right now that this is good for tidal volumes. Under minute ventilation will basically measure how much the patient breathes in one minute and how much they breathe per minute. You can also do tidal volumes in slow tidal capacities. I'm going to step up so you can actually see the vein moving. So I'd have the patient do a slow vital capacity, have them inhale as deep as they can, and exhale as fully and as deep as they can through the nose. So what we do is take a big breath in. a full breath as you can see that is five liters 760 cc's 5.7 so if you guys it's a little bit hard to see when i paused it but what he looked at is so he breathed out and so this small numbers up here that is how many liters and the exterior these are milliliters Okay, so he breathed enough to get um, five, uh, five liters, 760 milliliters. So this is a, a device called a Wright's respirometer that, as he said, you can measure tidal volume, minute ventilation, and even more um, importantly, uh, the vital capacity of a patient. Okay, so five, if you think about that, Five uh, liters and 760 milliliters is a lot. Okay, that's a that's a really large amount. So, if you guys can see what I, I, I we said that 15 mils per kilo of a of a body of a patient's body weight, um, that's not very much. So if they're not able to to blow out a large amount of volume um, from their vital capacity, then their um, strength is impaired. Can you say the volumes once again that it records? Yes. So it so a Wright's respirometer records tidal volume. Okay. It records minute ventilation. Okay. And it can record and it records the vital capacity. Okay. Thank you. You bet. And that's really important when you guys you guys are going to get on your clinical simulation exam. You're going to get two. Um, I mean, these are all important. But when you talk about spontaneous ventilator parameters, especially with a neuromuscular patient, and if you're deciding what to do with these patients, like intubate them or not intubate them, um, you're going to really look at your vital capacity and you're going to look at your MIP. And those are just really good indicators of a patient's respiratory muscle strength. Of course, you're always going to look at your um, arterial blood gases as well. And as we said, if it's less than, if it's 7.25 or less, you're also, it's going to require, your patient is going to require some assistance with oxygenation and ventilation. So just in general, I put up common causes of dyspnea. So we have uh, dyspnea, just meaning a, a patient's being short of breath. So that could be a variety of reasons. So think about um, so patients' uh, upper airway, so them having a foreign body, a, a foreign body down in their tracheobronchial tree, like they aspirated some food, an allergic reaction, some sort of a mass, airway stenosis, which is a um, which is a tightening, um, uh, like an anatomic um, structure that's not allowing uh, it's it's compressing the airway and it's not allowing it to open up. Tracheomalacia, which means like a floppy airway. Um, a lot of times patients are born with tracheomalacia. Um, and then lung or lower airway issues, pneumonia, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, interstitial lung disease, adult respiratory distress syndrome, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma or a mass uh, down in the lung. Cardiac, it could be an MI, congestive heart failure, pericardial infection, effusion, valvular disease, arrhythmias, and then metabolic or hematologic 
um, thyrotoxosis abnormal hemoglobins, anemia, disorders of phosphate, potassium, or calcium, sepsis, fever, or acidosis. And then we come down to a really big portion that uh, you're going to see in clinical practice. Um, and what we're going to continue to talk about today is neuromuscular. So Guillain-Barre syndrome or myasthenia gravis, different myopathies or neuropathies, and then psychogenic panic disorders, hyperventilation, just basic deconditioning, uh, maybe massive ascites, uh, which is where there's inflammation of the abdominal cavity uh, or drug withdrawal. So any of these um, you're gonna have to rule out. So spinal cord injuries um, are also a reason um, that you're gonna have to support patients. So injury to C6 to C7, means loss of function of all intercostals and abdominals. So any type of cervical, upper thoracic, the cervical area, um, they're gonna have, they're gonna have problems with respiratory uh, muscle strength. If there's an actual transection due to a spinal cord injury at C1 to C3, they're gonna actually have apnea and all respiratory muscles are gonna be affected. So these patients will require uh, ventilation support via airway and mechanical ventilation. So initially they'll get an endotracheal tube and then eventually they'll have to have a permanent tracheostomy and they'll be on a uh, ventilator. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about guillain barre and it is an ascending paralysis. So if you think about it, use the name itself. If you can't remember if it's ascending or descending and what that means is where do symptoms, uh, um, the um, uh, uh, decrease in muscle strength, where does that start? So in Guillain-Barre, think ground to brain, GB, okay? So generally, the patient will experience weakness in their lower extremities first. So it is a rare disorder. Um, it happens in the peripheral nervous system. It has a progressive demyelination and inflammation of the uh, nerve fibers. It slows the conduction of the nerve impulses and skeletal muscles. So microscopically, if you look at the patient's nerves, they're gonna be demyelated, inflamed, and then there's gonna be edema. So this is from uh, one of my favorite websites looking at rare disorders, um, uh, Nord. Uh, and it says Guillain-Barre syndrome is a rare, rapidly progressive disorder due to inflammation of the nerves, which is called polyneuritis, causing muscle weakness, some progressing to complete paralysis. Guillain-Barre syndrome affects approximately one or two people each year in every 100,000 population. Although it's, a, although it's precise cause is unknown, about half the patients have a GI or respiratory infection a few days before the onset. There is strong evidence that the immune response to the inf uh, infection produces a so-called autoimmune response, which damages the nerves, causing weakness and a loss of sensation. In milder diseases, the damage only affects the nerve sheaths and blocks the passage of nerve impulses. This can recover in a few weeks. In more severe disease, the autoimmune response damages the conducting cores of the nerves, and this may take longer to recover, and some people have permanent weakness. So the more severe the cases, the more we're going to have to intervene and help out with um, helping these patients with, uh, with ventilation. So once again, etiology is generally associated with a viral infection. So generally seven to 10 days after uh, the virus, there's an autoimmune response. Infections that can trigger are cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, hepatitis E, Zika, and guess what? Now COVID. Um, less, usually much less than one in a thousand uh, people um, who get an infection will get Gillian, will have Gillian Barre. But guess what? Of course, now um, this was just from April 17th, reporting in the April 17th online edition of the New England Journal of Medicine. The, the authors said that between February 8th and March 21st, three hospitals in the region treated about 1,200 patients with COVID 19. Five of those patients displayed symptoms most likely caused by Gillian Barre. So uh, not surprising um, when, 
the case study that I uh, posted to your assignment that you're going to do um, has when the Zika outbreak uh, was was uh, popular in 20, 2016. And mostly it was down in uh, more like tropical climates. They were report the hospitals um, down in those tropical areas, like in uh, South America and Central America, were reporting an excessive amount of Gilly and Beret syndrome. So as I said, it generally just followed some sort of virus. So, I mean, if you think about pathophysiology of the lungs, when patients don't have that muscular strength to have a good deep breath and cough, um, they're going to get mucus accumulation. They're going to get airway obstruction. They're going to get alveolar consolidation. They're going to get atelectasis. Clinical presentation will be weakness of lower extremities with uh, paresthesis or, or tingling sensations uh, that can progress up to the diaphragm. And when, get, when it gets to the diaphragm, um, that's when you know, you're going to have to help support the ventilation. Involvement of the autonomic, autonomic nervous system may lead to hypertension or heart dysrhythmias uh, as well. So, of course, early diagnosis improves the prognosis. So a, lung, a lumbar puncture will examine the patient's cerebral spinal fluid. And when they send that um, sample of CSF to the lab, when they see an increased um, count in proteins, that's when they can say that it's uh, most likely Guillain-Barre. There's also high uh, antibody titers of uh, IgM seen. And then an uh, EMG or an electromyography, it studies nerve conduction using small electrical shocks to simulate the nerves in the arms and legs, and it will record that uh, response in muscle and sensory nerves. So similar to an ECG, which measures the cardiac conduction in the heart, or an EEG, which measures the uh, conduction of, of nerves in the brain, this is an E, excuse me, this is an EMG. Treatment can be plasmapheresis, and we talked about that last week with some uh, interstitial lung diseases as well. So plasmapheresis connects one vein via a thin plastic tube to a machine which separates the plasma from the red blood cells and returns the red blood cells with a plasma substitute to another vein. This removes harmful substances, especially the antibodies which cause the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And then looking at uh, IVIG, um, this consists of giving high doses of immune globulin uh, into a vein. The pla uh, excuse me, um, the immune globulin comes from highly purified pooled plasma from thousands of healthy people. It probably works by blocking the effects of the harmful am antibodies, which causes GBS. IVIG is more convenient and more widely available than plasmapheresis, but both are equally effective. So using this IVIG, IVIG, what, do you, what does that sound like that's going on right now? Has anybody heard of giving the convalescent uh, blood from patients that have recovered from COVID? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same, same, same concept. So management for you guys, it's just as in every um, neuromuscular disease, it's supporting oxygenation and ventilating. So protocols would be oxygen therapy, airway clearance, hyperinflation, and then mechanical ventilation. Name me three parameters that you would say this patient is in respiratory failure. We must intubate and mechanically ventilate. Can anybody give me three? They have to have a respiratory rate of lower than six. Um, yeah. So if the, yeah. So if they don't have a re if they don't have respiratory rate uh, that's even six, um, definitely. But is that really what these patients would probably present with? Because what does that mean when you have a when you're hypoventilating with a respiratory rate less than six? What does that usually indicate? A low tidal volume and capacity. 
Yeah, so your, your answer is correct, low total volume capacity. But let's go back to that lower, that hypoventilation. What usually causes somebody to hypoventilate and not breathe greater than six times per minute? Does it have to do with the chemoreceptors? It could, but I mean, what would be the etiology? High Why CO2. Well, that's what it is. That's what it would cause. But what would be the cause of somebody not taking more than six breaths per minute? Um, failure to breathe. Yeah. Why? Why would you just, why would you become apneic? Or very bradypenic? Could be like ARDS or COPD. Well, I think ARDS and COPD, you're probably going to start breathing really fast and you're probably going to get up to that 35 breaths per minute. I remember talking about this when we did um, like types of hypoxemia. Perfect. Good. But I don't remember exactly why. <laughs> well, just think about it. Don't think about it from a book text standpoint, but just think about it. Why would people's drive to breathe be knocked out uh well could be the low pao2 well know. that would stimulate somebody to breathe because the uh, you guys are you guys are overthinking it so why would like like when we have maybe a trauma and a patient trauma. yeah so if a patient has a cns a brain injury the central nervous system injury and if they're if their drive to breathe gets knocked out because of a lot of swelling how about an overdose of opioids drugs yep yep okay <laughs> think about a cns central nervous system injury or an overdose in drugs because a lot of the other ones if you're dealing with dyspnea and a in a in a lung disorder um, that's that's completely different. Patients are going to try and compensate and then they're going to get to Kipnik and probably breathe over 35. Okay, so going back, you're right. A low vital capacity and a low MIP or NIF would say, ooh, respiratory muscle strength is, is really low. What's one more indicator for respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation? Can you guys give me one more? How about the pH value? Now, what pH value does your patient need to be intubated? 7.25? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what if, if they're at 7.25, 7.24, 7.23, and so forth, um, they can't compensate. They can't hyperventilate and, and, and compensate at that point. So they, they really need... Um, they really need to be in, intubated, mechanically ventilated. How about oxygen therapy? What's an indicator for oxygen therapy? Hypoxemia. Perfect. Define that. Give me give me objective values. Like um, eighty five percent PaO two. Okay, so so a, a PaO two less than what? Less than ninety. Okay, so let's say a PaO2, remember 80 to 100 is normal. So perhaps less than, than 80, okay? So when we actually have hypoxemia, remember mild hypoxemia, so 80 to 100 is normal, 60 to 80 is mild, 40 to 60 is moderate, and less than 40 is severe, okay? How about a, how about a saturation? At what saturation is oxygen therapy indicated? Uh, below 90. Okay. So 88 to 90. So technically it's below 88%. That's when patient is indicated for oxygen therapy. How about airway clearance? What's the indication for airway clearance? Like cystic fibrosis, like where they have a history of mucus buildup. Okay, so just mucus buildup. It doesn't have to be a disease. It could be, it could be any patient that has excessive secretions. Can you imagine a patient's, can you imagine a patient that has uh, weak muscles where they can't deep breathe and cough and then they get a, a respiratory infection like a pneumonia? 
think of all of that built up secretions. That's what you would have to do is, is get that out with airway clearance. Can somebody give me two modalities of airway clearance? What's a modality? Like I, mean, I give me an example. Yeah. Of, yeah, give me an example of what is airway clearance? What did, you, cup. what did you say? Percussion cups. Good. Okay, so CPT, that's one. Mm -hmm. yep. The vest. What else? The vest. Very good. What else? Inspirometry. The acapella. IS. Acapella. <laughs> IS. IS, is, IS. Hold on. Don't say IS yet because we're going to get there. So all of those that, remember the flutter valves, the acapella, all the ones that really um, we could feel it when we when I would go over there and touch your guys' chest and we could feel it vibrate. Anything that's really going to get down in there and mobilize the secretions. Okay. High frequency oscillation. High frequency oscillatory ventilation. Okay. Or, or chest wall oscillation. That's like the vest. Exactly. Very good. Okay. Hyperinflation. What are our modalities for hyperinflation? Whoever said incentive spirometry, that's what this is, right? What's another hyperinflation technique? Um, chest expansion. Yeah, what is that machine we just learned about before we went on break? The, the Metaneb. Yes. Great. Metaneb. Metaneb is fantastic. Very, very widely used. IPPB. Um, uh, uh, CPAP? Your PEP, your PEP therapy. CPAP also is. Okay, CPAP. Um, Oh boy. Um, easy pap. That's what I was thinking also. So your little easy pap devices, all of those that create a positive pressure to just put in more functional residual capacity in the lungs. Okay. Those are all different hyperinflation techniques. And then of course, mechanical ventilation. What's mechanical ventilation? Um, a machine that breathes for you. Oh, a machine that breathes for you. Very good. Um, and it does it provide negative or positive pressure? Positive. Positive. Excellent. Very good. Okay. So those are all your protocols that I don't care what patient you guys are going to come across. What your job on every single patient to do is to support oxygenation and ventilation. So whether it be through airway clearance, through uh, oxygen, hyperinflation techniques, mechanical ventilation, um, uh, you know, inhaled medications, any of that is, is going to help you support your oxygenation and ventilation. So that was Gillian Barre. Now we're going to talk about something, uh, another condition called myasthenia gravis. And once again, we're going to look at the name to tell us where the um, where the weakness starts. So in Gillian Barre, we said ground to brain. Now myasthenia gravis, it's going to be mind to ground. Okay, so um, symptoms are going to start generally in the in the head, in the in the in the facial region. So if you and look at they, the, sorry, quick question: yeah, Are sure. they like physical? Like, can you see it, or is it more just like people forgetting stuff or? Like no, losing their mind. No, so the, this, so both of these diseases are are um, affecting the skeletal muscles. So okay. it's not, yeah, good question. So it's not their, you know, their cognitive ability. Um, they're they're truly experiencing muscle weakness. So okay. like in beret, it generally starts as like, oh, I have leg muscle weakness. Myasthenia gravis, and I um, have a picture in here. Um, they literally start having. The most common sign is like droopy eyelids. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, literally the muscles are being um, uh, uh, blocked from moving. So <clears throat> with Gillian Barre, the nerves got inflamed and demyelated, and so they didn't they didn't work well. This one is a little bit different. This messes with the acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So if you can see here. Here's the nerve fiber, and here's the uh, muscle itself, and here's the neuromuscular junction. Um, do you see these uh, little pieces of uh, acetylcholine? Okay, so in here, this is 
what we want is for acetylcholine to um, uh, bind to its muscle receptor site. Here we have these um, different antibodies that's uh, really blocking that muscle receptor site and it's getting uh, uh, broken down with acetylcholinesterase. So this is a chronic disorder. Um, it has to do with the neuromuscular junction. It interferes with chemical transmission of the acetylcholine. It's characterized by fatigue and weakness as well. And it may be confined to one muscle group or may be generalized uh, throughout the body. So here we go. Here, once again, we have, um, this is normal. Here's the neuron itself. Here's those little uh, acetylcholine neurotransmitters. Um, they should go to their receptor sites. And then when they do, they'll activate the sodium and then it'll cause a uh, skeletal uh, muscle action potential. In myasthenia gravis, do you guys see these little antibodies? They block the receptor site. Okay, so the, the muscle um, action potential can happen. So what happens when someone has a stroke and like the whole left side of their body is droopy? Right. So that happens. Um, and once again, guess what now they're finding with COVID? Strokes are becoming more apparent. <laughs> Do you guys just feel like, I feel like every day there's another, um, every day that's like more bad news about COVID. So with strokes, what happens is there's a blood clot that gets um, caught up in, in the vasculature, okay? So in that, in that area, the, the brain gets ischemic, okay? So just like, say, the heart gets ischemic during an MI or the um, lung parenchyma will get ischemic in a pulmonary embolism, part of the brain that, um, so it's, it's, excuse me, it's localized to one area of the brain that controls movement and controls speech. So that area gets, um, pretty much has a uh, uh, death of the tissue there. Okay. What about something like Bell's palsy? Yeah, so that's where, um, that's a good question. So Bell's palsy is where a nerve gets blocked or um, damaged. And so it, it doesn't allow for movement of one side of the face. So it just becomes droopy. That's, um, that's a nerve condition as well. But the one thing that's, um, it's, it, I mean, it's terrible because it affects the patient's face, but with that, it doesn't generally affect other skeletal muscles. So they don't generally have breathing problems. So good questions, you guys. Um, Talking about myasthenia gravis again, um, the etiology, same thing. They don't really know why um, these conditions happen, but it's these circulating uh, antibodies of, immune, of the immune system, so anticholinergic antibodies, and it blocks the transmission of acetylcholine by, by blocking um, acetylcholine from the receptor, accelerating the breakdown of acetylcholine, acetylcholine and destroying the receptor sites. So it's, it's pretty bad. Once again, it could happen. Why do these antibiotic? Why do these uh, antibi antibodies go into a patient's body? They don't know. Generally, it's from infection, um, chronic electrolyte abnormalities, thyroid diseases, trauma, pregnancy, and then um, certain medications. So, clinical manifestation: droopiness of the eyelids. This um, this term called ptosis. So the P is silent, so it's just ptosis um, and the facial muscles. So you'll really see that. And it's in, like Christine mentioned, um, Bell's palsy, which is one side. This will be both sides. A patient can exhibit and feel double vision, slurring of the speech, dysphagia from lower facial and neck muscle weakness, and then some aspiration. A weakness of the neck muscles may cause the head to fall forward. Uh, possibly diaphragmatic weakness if it gets pretty um, severe, and then weakness of the arms and legs. So, so the manifestations, the signs and symptoms will start at the, at the top, at the head, and then move down with increased severity. And the case report that I posted actually had a patient uh, present with respiratory failure, and that's how they found um, the myasthenia gravis. So diagnosis, clinical history, um, this tensilon test, and we're going to talk about that. And it's in red because that'll help you distinguish 
between Gillian Barre and Myasthenia gravis. Once again, the EMG of uh, uh, neuromuscular transmission, um, assays of circulating antibodies in the blood. So Tensilon um, is the name of the test um, and the other term for it is Idrophonium. Um, so what they would do with the Tensilon test is um, through an IV, give the patient some Idrophonium and then perform some muscle movements such as crossing legs, uncrossing your legs, getting up from a sitting position in a chair, and the healthcare provider will check whether the Tensilon improves the muscle strength. So if they have muscle weakness of the eye or uh, face muscles, the effect of the Tensilon uh, will be monitored. So if you give the Tensilon, it'll, it'll pretty much stop those antibodies from um, blocking, um, blocking the acetylcholine messing with the uh, uh, or getting to its receptor site. So what happens, patients will improve um, if, if they're given this test. So, um, also an electric, so the EMG confirms diagnosis and identifies, uh, specific muscles involved. And that's just repetitive stimulation of a nerve and then recording the muscle response. Uh, frequent monitoring of lung mechanics and ventilatory strength, same, same thing. So protocols for this patient, also oxygen therapy, airway clearance, hyper, hyperinflation and mechanical ventilation. So give me, um, once again, what should the vital capacity be for an, in order for a patient to say, oh, they're okay? What's that critical value for vital capacity? Fifteen milliliters per kilogram. Perfect. Fifteen milliliters per kilogram. Excellent. How about what's the um, for MIP? What's that um, critical value for MIP? How much force should or pressure should a patient be able to generate taking a deep breath in? No, oh, I heard it. 25 to 30. Yeah, 25 to 30. Good. So if you had a patient come in and you tested their vital capacity and it was um, two liters or 2,000 milliliters, um, and then their MIP was negative 60 centimeters of water pressure, what if you came in um, eight hours later to test them and they were down to only 900 milliliters and negative 20 MIP, what would you think you might need to do with these patients? Mechanically ventilate? Yep, they probably need to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. What other, especially with myasthenia gravis, what, what other um, indicator would tell you that they're going to need a lot of help with intubation and mechanical ventilation? Maybe if they're unable to swallow, if they're unable to speak. But if you think about that, if they, if they can't swallow, um, they're at high risk for aspiration into their lungs. Okay. And then they're going to get a, then they'll most likely get pneumonia. So in addition to supporting oxygenation and ventilation, um, drug therapy, so long acting parasympathomimetics um, like neostigmine, uh, steroids, plasma per, uh, per plasmapheresis and a thymectomy. And the reason a thymectomy is because um, a lot of times it's a thyroid condition that's uh, causing um, this disorder. So if you remove that, you'll be removing um, abnormal uh, thyroid activity. Okay, so you guys are going to guess I have either Gillian Barre or I have myasthenia gravis. I'm going to read the first one and you're going to tell me which process it is. So we have chemical transmission of the acetylcholine is disrupted. We have symptoms starting in the head and neck region with eye mm -hmm. Tensilon is used for diagnosis. Uh, you're going to monitor. Gravis. Yeah, mm -hmm. monitor ventilation strength, support oxygenation, ventilation. Good. Myasthenia gravis. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Next one. Myelin sheath uh, in the peripheral nerves are damaged and inflamed. It starts in the lower extremities, so leg weakness. 
increase in, in um, uh, floating antibiotics, IgM. Excuse me, you'd monitor the ventilation strength and support oxygenation and ventilation, and that one is? Gillian Beret. Gillian Beret, very good. Okay, 